Here I am in Turkmenistan. Seems like every time I try to share, it's a fraction of what I wish it would be. We've looked at this place before. A strange city, country. In a lot of ways seeming modern and in others old. Or at least utilizing things that we now regard as tech all over the place in this country. Very few are allowed to live in this country or even visit. And the people that do live here are said to have free power. They don't pay for power. And the country is not frugal with its power, as you can see here. And these cars we see may be staged for this photo. There's essentially nobody here. They try to explain this away by saying it's very hot and most of the people reside underground. And for a untouristed, unpopulated country, it's really over the top. And again, they tell us there's free power. I'm sure they don't say that everything is gathering free energy. All these random things for nobody. Well, this man and this woman back here. And this guy must be a tourist. I could be wrong. And as usual, I think we're going to work backwards. I thank you for being here and welcome. So Turkmenistan, it's not the city I really wanted to focus on, but I guess any city will do. I was really just looking for old cities, the oldest, in fact. Here again, this is Turkmenistan. On the outskirts, this is the old city. Yes, and the old city going back to BC. Of course, they would tell us this is just mud, all mud stacked and standing here thousands of years. And I'm not really looking to look at the timeline right now. I mean, that's interesting. Here in Turkmenistan, there's just a massive hull fire that's been burning for years. A really interesting story. They call it the Horror Door to Hell, a tourist site in Turkmenistan. But anyway, I'm just looking for some of the oldest cities today. And so I jumped on to see what this site had to say. And they say there's not enough evidence to assert what conditions gave rise to the first cities. And here we can see Nuremberg in Germany. And we're told it flourished in the 15th century. And really mind-blowing, a walled city with towers fully built out, water being directed and utilized. Hence plumbing, little monuments, obelisks, but then showing primitive people. This man is thinking, why must I carry this basket every day? My knees are weak, this cane is too short. But anyway, I was looking for something older. Here we go. The foundations of an Anatolian town in Turkey. Aha, this is more like it. Now, this is either very, very old brick, or it's melted and vitrified brick. Either way, these foundations have been excavated. So they were under the dirt. And everywhere you go, no exception. Recently, I was doing excavations in my backyard. And when I hit nine feet, I hit a ledge. Just a ledge. Like, imagine the top of this. And I still don't know what it was. It was a platform, nine feet under. And the backhoe just scraped as if I was on a solid sheet of stone. And I look forward to completely excavating an area and seeing what it is because it was all soft until I hit nine feet. But anyway, this kind of ties back to Tartaria. I don't think Tartaria is any huge topic, but it's an important topic. I think it's been blown out of proportion over the years, and perhaps it has become something that it's not. But what it is, most certainly, is a region in this part of the realm. And now most people, if you ask them about China, they'll say, yeah, I know about China. Or Peru, they would say, yeah, Peru. Espana, they would say, oh yeah, Spain. 
France, everything really. Swede. But if you ask them about Tartary or Tartaria, they'll look at you like a deer in the headlights. And why? I want to stop immediately and thank all my Patreons, and in particular Shem. Thank you. I had mentioned that I was looking for this map, or one like it, even though there's hundreds, and he found a version showing exactly what I was looking for. So again, thank you. And the mainstream now wants to tell our community that we are fools, and that this was nothing. This was just a territory, and this was not a city, like Peking, that we see here, and China, or Moscow, that we see here. No, they want to tell us that this doesn't mean anything. And although we see hundreds of different names in these countries as cities, in other maps, they're depicted as little castles, showing how grand, giving an indication of the population based on the size of the castle. Today we do this with the size of the dot. But here what we see is the capital city of Tartary, or Tartaria, as Sellingham. And though this is not the exact map that I had seen, I'm very excited to be able to at least share it. Well, oh, hello, Gigi. So here's Sellingham, and if we look down here, actually, we can see for Persia, a capital city of Hispaham, and I see so many hams. Bellingham. Name your ham. And I typically avoid ham, but to me, this goes back to ham in the Bible, and it's been months, maybe even a year, and formulating my thoughts from then today is a little tricky right now. But to me, all the hams are stressing a city of either Ham or his descendants. And I believe that these cities are biblical. The buildings, the canals, the roads, the establishment of this realm is biblical. And how far back is that? I'm not sure. The timeline is all messed up, as we've discussed so much, done by design. And what's certain is throughout this history, there have been several resets by flood, by fire plasma, shaking of the land, everything. And if we follow the Native American Hopi, this has happened four times, and we're in the fifth. And there's evidence of this. And this region and history has been omitted. And all the other histories have been altered. We read them, at least I do, week after week. Ridiculous narratives for every nation in the realm. This one has been left out completely. And I would love to lay this on a map modern day and see what this is or what the site is. Maybe it's ruins, maybe it is a city today. Let me know if you know. I find this to be important. And at the same time, it may not matter. One part of the puzzle. Except this one has been omitted again. So what clue did somebody not want us to tie back to this region? So here we have selling ham, and here we have ham. If I ate any kind of pork, it would be bacon. But I don't like the way it makes me feel. Something weird. So Ham was the second son of Noah. And I think by design this food product has been given this ridiculous name. Or this name was nice and it was attributed to something completely opposite. But I digress. The second son of Noah. His descendants and others having populated Africa and adjoining parts of Asia. So here we're in the adjoining parts of Asia. And they're telling us that this region does have ties to Ham. Here we can see Ham. Very bearded. And so here, going back to this history of cities, I was looking for mention of Ham. And in fact, I have something on my wall that says Cain built the first city. And that's actually what I was looking for, was cities of Cain. Let me know. If you have any leads, and Cain, Cain and Abel, son of Adam, the first man, and here, the Sumerian city of 
or or er in iraq totally cooked out only the footprint remaining in sumerian so this is going back to this time so yes it's to say that yes the first man just starts building cities in which we can see the ruins of today made of brick this is our history no evolution and ham is the link and tartaria and the city of Sellingham. And these guys were going to Asia, to Ethiopia, traveling throughout the realm, building the same things, the same architecture that we see in all stages. We see it in its glory, and we see it in absolute ruin. But the same hand, and only us, in the last hundred years, have broken tradition. We build cubes like the Borg, and the ruins are scattered and buried. This is it. These are the first to build. And where are we? We're in Syria. Can you imagine this city? If this is just the ruins? Again, most of it buried under this grassy field. So, back to Turkmenistan, where I think we can see all stages. We see the brick core. We see the facading that has cooked off, that would have made this look nice and ornamental. And everything just out in the desert, and our history portraying them as primitive. And we are just clueless ants, trying to make a living amongst the ruins of a past and great civilization. And as always, I question why. Why lie? Why lie about the mud flood? Why tell us that the brick buildings buried under the ground were ours, in fact? We just forgot about them. They got buried over time. I don't know why, except for the idea that it must help propagate today's lies. This is a puzzle piece. Everything we've been taught as children, indoctrinated, brainwashed to believe, ties into the present. And we must believe what we are told in order to further the agenda. And I don't know what the agenda is. I just know what I know. I think we know as a community. This research will progress, more will be revealed, but I think again it ties back to the present, because again I think that these histories that we've been given are not so important for history. History is dead. It's more important for the present, and I think it's important that we keep our eyes open in every regard to what we are being sold. I mean, both in a monetary respect and ideas in general. So let's take a little pause and have a part two. Okay, we're gonna look at something kind of juicy. This is actually an old mining town in Nevada. It's called Rhyolite. And here's the kind of ruins we get over there. We see brick on the top, concrete. And old pictures show this town really built out. And then just somebody came in and ruined it. Same with another town in Nevada called Metropolis. And here's just a little peek of what's left of Metropolis. And I absolutely plan on going out here with Chief. And I was going to spend a moment or two looking at these two towns. But something else has popped up that I find more important. And that's an interview that I watched today with a Norman Dodd. He was born in 1899. How we would love to talk to somebody born in 1899. What would they tell us? He would have been a young child when things were getting underway. But nonetheless, this is a man who has done some serious research. And unfortunately, he was shunned. And most people will never hear of what he discovered. And I think you all, our community, would be very interested in what this man discovered. We often look into history. Always, actually. And what we find is that it's a bunch of BS. Laughable, really. A poorly written history, often repeating the same themes. And I've spent years now showing the ridiculous nature of this historical narrative. And at times I touch on the characters. Three times I've tried to make a video on one character in particular. 
and three times I have failed. Very strange. But today I'm going to try something else. I'm going to share somebody else's work with you. The work of this Norman Dodd. Now if you do a search on him, here I've just typed in his name, you get this video, and this is the video I just watched. Looks like the earliest version is about 14 years ago, posted on this platform. And what do they say about him? He was a banker, manager, and served as chief investigator in 1953 for a special committee on tax-exempt foundations. He went to Yale, worked in manufacturing, and eventually devoted himself to banking. Around the time of 1929, the stock market crashes, and he was assigned by superiors at the bank to restructure the bank to avoid another crash. He worked on this task, a little confused of why he'd been selected for this, but he returned and said very simply, we need to return to sound banking. Really interesting that they would task him with this. And anyway, they told him that they could not implement his recommendations and that the United States will never see sound banking again. So this is really at the beginning of his career, in his 30s, and he's shocked. They tell him to stop looking into it, and to put his feet up on the desk and wait for his retirement, and do nothing. Not even work, kind of a hush deal. And he resigns, and continues looking into the research that he had started. And it really comes down to these tax-exempt foundations. On the surface, they appear to be charitable and do good works. So at some point, this man starts a committee, the Reese Committee, that is investigating these exempt foundations. And he's approached by these foundations, by the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Foundation. Eventually, he gets permission to read the minutes, handwritten records of the conversations that were had going back to the early 1900s, to the first meeting, in fact. And he was given permission by new heads of these exempt foundations. And they didn't think there was going to be anything in it. And this is, you know, 50 years of records. And what he discovers is pretty shocking. I took some screenshots. In the Carnegie Minutes, they're looking at how to change history and the lives of an entire people. They conclude that no more effective means than war is the solution. He says the president of the Ford Foundation sent for him, and he went to his office, and he tells him, Mr. Dodd, we've asked you to come here, off the record, if you would tell us why the Congress is interested in the activities of foundations such as ourselves. Then he continued to speak, the head of the foundation, and says, Mr. Dodd, all of us that have a hand in the making of policies here have had the experience, the Office of Strategic Services, and operate from directives from the White House. He says, would you like to know the substance of these directives? We are all here to operate in response to similar directives, the substance of which is that we use our grant-making power so to alter life in the United States that it can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Ding! And Mr. Dodd, shocked, responds that this is why Congress is investigating these foundations and ultimately this guy. And this guy says, I don't think you're entitled to withhold this information from the people of the country. Why don't you just tell the people what you told me? And his answer was, we wouldn't do any such thing. And Mr. Dodd says, well, we have no choice but to continue to investigate. So he goes on to hire one of his team members, a woman who is very skeptical, and he chose her on purpose. She was very much by the book, and she would go through these 50 years of handwritten documents, the minutes of the Carnegie Foundation. And again, the Carnegie Foundation begins in 1908. So this is great. I have discovered 
thousands of Carnegie libraries and buildings. And this is definitely a key player. And in that year, the first year, the trustees of this foundation, meeting for the first time, raised a specific question, Mr. Dodd says. They discuss this question all year, and the question is, is there any means known more effective than war? Assuming you wish to alter the life of an entire people, they conclude that no. Now, in 1909, they raise a second question and discuss it. So here we go. Here is our supposed benevolent foundation, and they're discussing war right away. Now, second question. Early 1900s, how do we involve the United States in a war, they say. And at that time, nobody gave a damn about war. He talks about the Balkans. Finally, they answer the question as follows. We must control the State Department. So here you go. Really early on, 10 or so years after this man, Norman Dodd, is born, these foundations are scheming and they have handwritten documents the minutes in which this man had the opportunity to glean congressionally give a report openly and here the foundation wants to control the state department and they say how do we do that the answer we must take over and control the diplomatic machinery of this country finally they resolve to aim at that as an objective. Then time passes, and eventually there is a war. World War blank. At the time, they record in their minutes, essentially like a corporate diary, a shocking report in which they dispatch to President Wilson a telegram cautioning him to see that the war does not end too soon. So this foundation almost giving orders to the president. Of course, all these key players will be part of greater factions, in which I will not name, but these foundations are in the open, whereas these lesser-known factions take place in secrecy. And their goal, ultimately, this is just one foundation. This guy investigated a handful of the key players. And what they're looking to do is prevent what they call a reversion of life in the United States to what it was prior to 1914. And to do this, they proclaim they must control education in the United States. They realized it was a pretty big task. This is in the minutes, mind you. This guy is researching the truth in the 50s about the early 1900s. And this man passed away shortly after this interview. But anyway, the Carnegies knew this was a big task to control the education system. So they approached the Rockefeller Foundation, another foundation. I've talked about the Rockefeller Foundation, how they pretty much destroyed the electric vehicle, played a part in getting all the electric trolleys dismantled that ran from coast to coast and helped ensure that we take a giant step backwards. So the Rockefeller Foundation handled the education branch in the United States and the alteration of the teaching of American history. So they approach four of the most prominent historians, Charles Bird or Beard, and they suggest that they alter the manner in which the history is presented. They get turned down flat, so they decide to build their own stable of historians. Then they approach the Guggenheim Foundation. Mind you, all tax-exempt foundations sucking up taxpayer grant money to execute their will, their malevolent will. And essentially, they groom a group of 20 new historians under this fellowship through the Guggenheimer and Rockefeller foundations. They essentially created their own experts on American history. They were sent to London and briefed into what was expected of them in exchange for these doctorates. So really just making them experts 
overnight, as long as they teach this new history. The group of 20 historians that they created ultimately become the nucleus of the American Historical Association. And you have to realize this is going on in the early 1900s. This guy is just discovering it in the 50s and only sharing it in the 80s. And what are they trying to teach with this new history, as I said in the last part? What is the aim of a false history, a false present, of course? And back then they were saying the future of this country belongs to collectivism, with a touch of American efficiency. That is the story that grew out of the false history. And in short, this investigation was thrown out. A win for evil, but not without the truth, at least coming out in the 80s and again 15 years ago on YouTube and today on my channel. I suggest you watch this interview, a little less than an hour, and I think I'll just end this here. I hope you've enjoyed. I love you all. Do have a blessed day, and I'll see you next week.